Hi there, this is Matt Heffernan. Welcome back to my channel. This video is in anticipation of a new series I will be producing based on the other famous microprocessor of the 8-bit era, the Zilog Z80. I'm going to have tutorials for Z80 assembly language, just like I'm still doing for 6.5 CO2 assembly and its use for Commander X16 development. But before I start that, I want to take a look at the history of the Z80, its relationships with other processors, and the many systems it was used in, including the system that I am going to be focusing on in my new series. There was no such thing as a microprocessor, or even a desktop computer, until a young Silicon Valley company named Intel started developing a complete central processing unit, or CPU, in a single integrated circuit package. What was then a large circuit board with lots of discrete components was first shrunk down to a tiny chip with Intel's 4004. As impressive as this technical achievement was in 1971, the 4004 was not about to replace the CPU of contemporary computers like the Digital Equipment Corporation PDP-11 or the IBM System 360. It was only a 4-bit processor and was only able to power a calculator. It was a relatively small and lightweight calculator compared to the mechanical adding machines of the day, but not a general purpose computer. The very next year, Intel released the first 8-bit microprocessor, the 8008. This was a massive improvement in capability, but it was also very limited and not really up to the task as the CPU for a general purpose computer. It found use in so-called dumb terminals that provided a CRT monitor and keyboard interface to a larger computer. A few computer kits and the very earliest pre-built commercial personal computers used the 8008, but none were exactly successful due to its limitations, like 14-bit addressing and having data pins double as address pins, requiring a lot of external logic that drove up system costs. Intel finally achieved commercial success in 1974 with the 8080, with a beefy 40-pin dual inline package, eliminating a lot of the compromises needed to keep the 8008 as an 18-pin dip chip. The 8-bit micro-revolution had begun, and Intel was at the forefront while competitors like Motorola and MOS were still working on getting their own 8-bit microprocessors to market. The design of all three of these microprocessors was led by Federico Fagin, one of the head engineers at Intel at that time. We'll hear more about him later. The 8080 was at the heart of the first commercially successful personal computer, the MITS Altair 8800. It was little more than the pins of the 8080 connected to a bunch of switches and LEDs, but it was enough to push the microcomputer out of the homebrew hobbyist domain and into the commercial sector. It didn't hurt that a couple of kids outside Seattle named Paul Allen and Bill Gates had written a basic interpreter for it, famously without access to anything but an 8080 emulator running on a PDP-11. That program running on the first hardware test in front of MIT's leadership is a big reason why 75% of all desktop computers are running Windows today. The first 11 months of 1975 had MIT standing alone atop the burgeoning mountain of microcomputing, but serious competition would finally arrive in December with the release of the IMSI 8080. The Radio Shack parts bin aesthetic was replaced with a more professional presentation of large colored plastic switches and the rows of LEDs placed behind flat tinted lenses. It could pass for a mini computer CPU of the day, but it was actually a complete computer with expandability. You may even recognize it from the many films and TV shows it appeared in, including war games, where it was demonstrated as capable of triggering a nuclear war. Luckily, that did not happen, but Intel's own 8-bit Armageddon was right around the corner. Before we get to that imminent demise, let's take a quick look at the 8080 itself. It has a lot of the hallmarks of the 8-bit processors to come, including an 8-bit accumulator, general-purpose 8-bit registers that could be combined into 16-bit registers, and a wide variety of addressing modes and branch conditions. While it was already more sophisticated than the 6502 that we know and love, it still had some shortcomings that kept the systems around them from having the combination of power and affordability that the market wanted. Enter Zilog, a new upstart with some familiar names at the helm. Federico Fagin, the lead engineer of those first three microprocessors at Intel, left the company shortly after the release of the 8080, along with fellow senior Intel employee Ralph Ungerman. 
Fajin believed that he could make a better microprocessor and enable computer manufacturers to build systems inexpensively that were more than switches and lights. Soon he and Ungerman got Masatoshi Shima to leave Intel too. And now Zilog had both the technical leadership and the engineer responsible for laying down the actual transistors on the original Intel processors. Their first product was the Z80, and they hoped to make it live up to the promise of the name Zilog, which Fajin said was meant to convey the last word in integrated logic. The chip was ready to ship in 1976, along with an assembler and a development system for programmers to test their code on real hardware. The primary goal of the Z80 was to have a CPU that was completely compatible with 8080 machine code. Oddly enough, the copyright laws at the time meant that while executing the same machine code was okay, writing software in the same proprietary assembly language was not. So Zilog's assembler had to use all new instruction mnemonics and syntax. Serendipity gave Zilog the opportunity to make the assembly language more streamlined and expandable at the same time. They were able to define additional registers and instructions, as well as improve the way interrupts worked and provide built-in handling for dynamic RAM refreshing. These features meant that even less external logic was required to make the Z80 functional, and opened up the opportunity to use the cheaper DRAM over the expensive static RAM required by other microprocessors. This is everything that computer manufacturers were looking for to get their machines to the price point that would make sense for small businesses to invest in personal computers, rather than sharing time on someone else's mainframe. This resulted in an explosion of Z80-based microcomputers hitting the market, starting with the Tandy Radio Shack TRS-80 in 1977. It fit a small business computer inside a full-stroke keyboard, with 4 kilobytes of DRAM and a basic interpreter burned into an internal ROM. It connected to a slightly modified black and white TV for a monitor, and could load and store programs from a standard tape deck, all available at your local Radio Shack store. The TRS-80 was quickly followed by more Z80-based systems, most capable of running Digital Research's CPM operating system, including the Zenith Z89, the TRS-80 Model 3, the Osborne 1 and K-Pro 2 luggable computers, the stylish Atrona Attaché, the Epson QX10, and eventually the TRS-80 Model 4, complete with dual 8-inch floppy drives that would continue supporting this new standard of microcomputers into the early 90s. These machines eventually coexisted with IBM's 16-bit PCs, with Intel's even more successful 8088 processor, which gave way to the 8286 and eventually the 32-bit 8386 and the 64-bit x86 computers that dominate desktop and enterprise computing today. So things worked out for Intel, but Zilog kept chugging along throughout the 1980s. As the Z80 business computers gave way to the IBM PC and its clones, Zilog still did very well in its intended market of embedded systems, including some of the most popular video arcade games of the early to mid-1980s, especially from Namco, the makers of Pac-Man, and Nintendo, who hit it big with Donkey Kong, and the little Italian plumber that tries to defeat him. But what happened at the same time was the arrival of extremely inexpensive home computers, starting with the Sinclair ZX80 which was the cheapest possible computer someone could make in 1980 that could let a user type in basic programs on a membrane keyboard and see the results on a standard television. It sold for just under 100 British pounds, and it was a real computer, if not terribly useful for doing anything other than executing a very short text-based basic program. This was followed quickly by Sinclair's more advanced ZX81 and ZX Spectrum, the latter of which becoming wildly successful as a home gaming platform. Back at Zilog's home in the States, the Coleco Atom came out, followed by the Amstrad CPC in the UK, and the multi-vendor standard MSX computer, mostly in Japan, where it saw a high level of success comparable to the ZX Spectrum in the UK. But that wasn't all for the Z80. It was also used in the still popular TI-81 series of graphing calculators by Texas Instruments as well as a bunch of home video game consoles, including the ColecoVision, the Sega Master System, and even the Sega Game Gear handheld console. By the end of the 80s, the Z80 was cheap enough to include as a secondary processor in the Sega Mega Drive, known in North America as the Genesis, 
where it controlled the sound for 16-bit games and also provided backward compatibility for running Master System games. So if I'm going to have a Z80 tutorial series, what platform should it target? As someone who spent his whole life in the U.S., there's no obvious candidate. No single platform was dominant, and there are a lot more failures than successes, more also-rans than standards. But wait, you might say, what about the Nintendo Game Boy? It was the dominant handheld in North America, even fending off the more capable and colorful Game Gear. Didn't that original Game Boy have a Z80? Well, not really. It had a custom CPU made by Sharp called the LR35902. It was based on the 8080, but rather than being fully compatible, it actually left out some of the original 8080 features, leaving behind a subset of its capability. It did, however, incorporate some of the additions of the Z80, but not all of them. This places the Game Boy somewhere in between the 8080 and the Z80, and not quite encompassing either. So that's not going to work for my series. I need a platform with a large user base, simple design, good gaming potential, and a mature emulator that can run on Linux. There's really only one system that fits the bill. Our old friend, the Specky. Truth be told, I didn't even know about the existence of any Sinclair computers until I started getting into the online retro community a few years ago. I've never seen a ZX Spectrum in person, much less used one, nor have I ever seen the American version, the Timex Sinclair 2068, anywhere in the wild. It was not at all successful in the North American market, where the Commodore 64 and eventually the Nintendo Entertainment System left it without a foothold. Despite all this, the Specky ticks all the boxes, and it's a natural fit for a tutorial series. The ZX Spectrum Next is now on the market, providing a modern hardware platform for running compatible software, even if the Z80 is implemented as an FPGA core. I won't be targeting any of the newer capabilities of the Next, but it does mean that there is new hardware out there that can run the programs we'll be making, and it can work with a modern TV and not require a PAL tuner which is getting exceedingly difficult to find in the States. I will be using the Free Unix Spectrum Emulator, or Fuse, for running programs and making new demos for YouTube. Eventually, I want to be able to create a new game for the ZX Spectrum and share that code with the world. There's a lot to come, so stay tuned. The best way to make sure you don't miss anything is to subscribe to my channel and click the bell to receive notifications when new episodes are available. If you can't wait for that, join our Patreon community and get early access to all my videos before they go public and see your name at the end like these folks you see here. If you're excited about more Z80 content, please click the like button for this video and let me know in the comments what you'd like to see me do with the ZX Spectrum. This will be a voyage of discovery for me, so guidance from British viewers would be especially helpful. Thanks, and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.